Well, good evening, everyone, and happy Sabbath. It's not Sabbath here yet, but we'll be in a couple hours. And um, welcome to this evening's study. Of course, this is a study on uh, the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And we have we've done quite a few studies. We've been doing this now for, oh, I can't even remember now what study number this is. So this is study number 95 and so it's once once a week and so you know that we've been doing this for almost two years it's hard to believe 52 weeks in in a year so once it gets up to 104 then it'll probably be two years i think but anyway and we've gone through a lot of material we've covered um at jones 1893 1895 general conference bulletins uh, we read lots of spirit of prophecy statements. We went through uh, uh, Wheeland and Short's book on uh, 1888, Reexamined. We went through some of Wagner's material, um, his book on Galatians. And then to finish this off, we, we studied Wagner, his, his last thing that he wrote, often called his deathbed confession or his confession of faith. And, and now we're reading this uh presentation that A.T. Jones did to the in front of the General Conference in 1909. And what we're trying to learn from these these experiences is we know that Jones and Wagner, they presented a true message, but they had difficulties themselves. And each of them had a different problem. And I think they're representative of what we see happening Within this movement, within the Adventist church, you know, Wagner goes off basically away from the truth. But Jones, as a, a person who's standing stalwart for truth, also departs from it in a sort of, well, for lack of a better word, a self-righteous fashion. That is, he believes that he's right, and he, and he is in a lot of ways. But just being right in in word doesn't mean you're right indeed. And the way that he went about things, some of the worst part of his nature came out. And all of us have have these snares that beset us, these these things that we have to watch for. And for every person, it's, it's a different problem. Now, when I, um, so before we get into this, we're going to have to pray. But the one thing I want to want to say is that, uh, and we'll talk a bit more about this after I pray, but We've seen a lot of people, I'm sure all of us have seen a lot of people come and go, not just within this movement, but within Adventism. And we want to, we want to stand, yes. for the, we want to stand for the truth. And it's not an easy thing. The road to life is narrow. It's difficult. And we need God to help us. So let's open this study with a word of prayer. Dear gracious heavenly father, we come to you as the Sabbath is approaching. And we have, in some ways, heavy hearts. We are thankful for the Sabbath and for the joy that we experience in fellowship. We are thankful for the studies that we have. But um, we think about the experience uh, that, that we have seen others go through and that we ourselves have struggled with, the experience of righteousness by faith. It's easy to explain the theory it's much more difficult to put this into practice. And Lord, you know that there's so much in us that is unlike you. And that for us to be your representatives upon this earth just doesn't really make any sense. But we know, Lord, that you want to use us to represent your character. And we look at these experiences of the past especially as we look at A.T. Jones' personal experience, somebody who was right but was also wrong in how he approached uh, defending your truth. Like Moses, he smote the rock instead of speaking to it. And we know, Lord, that we have done many things very similar and often even worse, that we haven't represented you in every way that we should. And so we pray for each person who is watching uh, these studies. We ask, Lord, that... Um, you can speak to their heart just as you have been speaking to ours. And um, we pray for those that, that can't be here for different reasons, just the trials that face us. We pray for Dwight and, and his family. 
And uh, we know, Lord, that uh, there's people that we love that we wish were here, that we're sharing in this fellowship. But Lord, you know what's in our hearts and you know what each of us needs. And so we entrust others into your care. And then we ask, Lord, that you can take us and use us. We ask for guidance in this study this evening. And as we read the words of A.T. Jones and we can see the truth in it, that we can also discern things in his character and ours that have hindered your work upon this earth. So we leave all things in your hands and we ask that your presence can be here through thy spirit. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome everyone. So, you know, I always find this study um, when we did Wagner and the study with Jones uh, difficult, right? And, and, and all I can think about, you know, when I'm reading Jones is I think about us, you know, myself and, and others who profess to believe the truth, but don't always represent it and take slight against the truth personally when it's really just a slight against God and nothing that, that, and God can defend his truth. And what God is asking us is to, to trust in him, even when things don't appear to be going the way that we think they should. So Jones here is talking about this test in this, in this section of his presentation. He's talking about this test that, um, to be a minister and that there was injustices done. That is, there doesn't seem to be a reason from what he has presented that they should have removed his ministerial credentials. That is, what they look at is that basically he's a troublemaker. He's not teaching any error, but he's not submitting to their authority, which Jones doesn't recognize. And we've all seen and we've all been asked to submit to unjust authority. And we've often even justified the decision not to submit to an authority because, you know, who are they to, you know, to be a judge or a ruler over us, right? Or maybe we think that they're they're actually wrong and they can do what they want, but they can't tell me what to do. And and in some ways, they the unjust authority creates the problems that they think that they're trying to stop. But actually, I don't really think that they're they're trying to stop the problems that they say they're trying to stop. I, I believe that uh, the result that they get, which is rebellion, is the result that they want, right? They want to push buttons. They want to see people rebel. And if people could act in a Christ-like way, you have a much greater tra- chance of God overruling the decisions of men. When you stand up and fight for your rights, you're inhibiting God's power to overrule. I hope that makes sense. Right? We take things into our own hands, then we're, we've taken them out of God's hands. But it is human nature. So, um, so he says, anyway, where did they get this something else, this formerly unknown thing? Well, he says, I appeal from it. Does this general conference assembled in session propose to sanction a procedure that puts the ministerial and denominational standing of every Seventh-day Adventist minister in such subjection as that to the arbitrary will, the official caprice, or the personal resentment of a few men of a mere committee sitting 4,000 miles away or anywhere at all? Does this general conference in session assembled sanction this self-erected foundation of faith and tribunal of ministerial standing? Now, and we know that that um, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is, has a very interesting structure. Now, I don't know if a lot of people know about the different forms of church government and where Adventism stands. But Adventism um, is sort of a a dichotomy. It's it's not really, at least it wasn't designed to be, a hierarchy. It was meant to have a congregational structure, grassroots up, Kelly put there. That is, that the church, the local church, has an authority that the general conference does not have or the conference does not have. And and that authority is the membership. That is, the conference is not supposed to be able to disfellowship an individual member. 
right? So this this uh, congregational way of doing things is pretty good, right? Now it's it's but the church also has the control of the ministers, right? The ministerial control. That is, in, in our churches, we don't hire individually our ministers. There are many churches that do, many t- denominations. A local church will decide they need a new minister. They can fire their minister and they advertise or make a call out to different people's names that come up and, and they they hire a minister. We don't do that in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Yeah, that's how Ford kept his membership. Yeah. He never lost his membership. Kelly just put a context there. So, yeah, now he had his ministerial c- credentials removed. Um, and so that happens on a conference level. I'm not sure exactly how all the details work. And, and of course, we, we, you know, they, they sort of, when we get our minister, they kind of, you know, have a meeting with us and we think this minister is a good fit, but you really don't have a choice of what minister you get. They, they basically appoint a minister to you. And, and this, this actually is a good balance. It, it, um, it limits some of the power of the conferences and, um, and, and allows that sort of independence within the, the church itself to operate. But nothing's perfect because people aren't perfect. And of course, we know that, that there can be a lot of pressure placed upon a minister to remove a member. And that minister can put a lot of pressure on people to remove uh, that person, right? So, so there, there's a lot of politics that can go on when people aren't truly converted. So there's no such thing as, as a perfect system. Now, part of the problem, you know, that happened, we talked a bit about it, 1901, Ellen White called for a reorganization because decisions were being made in Battle Creek for the world church and, and that people need to have a lot more independence to make decisions in their field, right? So a lot more freedom. And, and that's, that's good organization. A good manager doesn't, um, dictate every detail of somebody working under him. He encourages him when he does things well and um, really allows people because you you have people in positions that you can trust and you allow them to make decisions, uh, a lot of decisions on their own. And of course, you know, they're still accountable for those decisions that they make. You know, they can be reviewed or whatever, but uh, you don't want to have a micromanagement of, of, um, a manager micromanaging each individual. So, um, you know, so this is, this is part of the problem. Now, now Jones, of course, his real issue has to do with the fact that there's this conflict over this message of righteousness by faith and over his vision of what should happen and over the vision of many people in leadership of what should happen. There's a conflict of visions and, uh, Jones, in some ways, he's he's not he's not good at cooperating with other people when he differs with them. So he has some character defects that Ellen White points out here and there. Doesn't mean he's a bad person, but definitely he wasn't treated well. Like we can't say that you know the Jones isn't justified in in seeing these problems. But the question is not whether you're justified or not. The question is what would Jesus do? How would Jesus act? In this situation, and we've all been faced with this this situation. Now, some people really believe that they need to to protest and make their voices heard when some injustice occurs. And you know, and, and I, I think about well, Kelly's here, and you know, when he got a disfellowship from Calgary Central. Uh, prior to that, you know, he's having some meetings with. Um, well, I guess it was the the associate pastor. And some elders, right, Kelly? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, and and they were sort of telling you what all the problems were with the 2520, even though they didn't understand anything about it. And they didn't really want um, you. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't really want you to present what you thought. And then you kind of got railroaded no, in your I, fellowship, thing, right? I mean, you can give a bit of detail yeah. about it. The, the, I was thinking about that just the other day, actually. Uh, the part about being... Uh, them saying everything that was wrong and not giving me an opportunity. 
Well, they did give me an opportunity, but it was always very on the spot, and I wasn't prepared. Mm-hmm. And they, I remember the one time when they were trying to figure out what to do with me. I'm waiting in the foyer, and the elders are in the meeting room, and the associate pastor is going in and out about three mm-hmm. times. And about the third time, he looks at me and he says, thanks for waiting. And he's going in and out with these photocopies of information that he's poisoning the well with. Yeah. So I, I really didn't stand much chance when I, one, one fellow that I was friends with slammed his fist on the table and he said, this is nothing but the same stuff as Waco, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so there was, really, <laughs> there was, there was really not much opportunity, but what did the one quote was, uh, that did give me the that did get them to give me an opportunity to speak was uh, the one about if a brother differs from you, you know, give him a chance. You know the quotes. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was a thirty thirty one to two vote, and I did ask for a secret ballot as well, yeah. which they did. Yeah. Which was interesting. Hmm. Now, you know, in my experience now, like if, if they were ever going to like disfellowship me or something, uh, I just wouldn't care. But, you know, uh, I don't know if that's good or not. But, you know, it's just when, when I became an Adventist, I wasn't really interested in joining the church. They just said, well, you get baptized, you automatically become a member. I'm like, okay, you know, doesn't bother me none. But, but I'm a pretty independent mind. Look. Let me comment on the numbers at that business meeting of Calgary Central with a membership of over 1,200, 600 mm-hmm. in attendance on a given Sabbath, and a minimum of 100 members at any given business meeting. There yeah. were 33. There were 33. They were the ones called. <laughs> it was a called yeah. business meeting for my purposes. You know, very interesting similarities to, you know, trials at midnight and such mm-hmm. no so it, it so all these injustices happen and but 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 let me say yeah i didn't protest yeah no you just you just allow people to do what they do and you just go about doing things that you know to be right at least that's what we should be doing so jones goes on but what is this new thing that is so far from the general conference committee can go has thus been established as the one transcendent test of ministerial standing in the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, a test in the presence of which 30 or even 50 years of consistent character and doctrinal integrity count for absolutely nothing. Here it is, here it is exactly as officially stated and adopted and published by themselves, that A.T. Jones' work and influence have ceased to be helpful to the denomination from which he received his credentials that his public utterances and published statements, which have been widely circulated, show his attitude to be antagonistic to the organized work of the denomination, which granted him his credentials. Yeah, there it is. And when when found, what is it? Oh, it is the denomination, the denomination, and the organized work of the denomination. Now, the profession is that the denomination is a Christian church. Yes, even the very Christian church itself. And if that be so, then the denomination is in the world to help men and not be helped by men. That is the Christian order. But in this formerly unknown and transcendent standard, the Christian order is reversed. And lo, denomination is here to be helped by men instead of to help men. Men exist for the denomination and not the denomination for men. Is the Sermon on the Mount good for anything more? If so, or anything anymore? If so, then please read Matthew 5, verse 43 to 48, and Luke 6, 32 to 36. And uh, we're going to read those here. So one of the things, we we could look at this, instead of talking about the denomination, uh, we could even talk about the movement. And, and I'm not here trying to you know, be antagonistic towards this movement. But the movement wanted to become a denomination. They wanted to become a new church. This is this this was the plan that the movement had, and and they began that work in 2016 to some degree when they made uh, the elders. Um, 
so Tabo and Parminder and um, the other guy. So they, they they set up these elders, and and Parminder was supposed to be you know the one in charge of Europe organizing there. They they had in 2017, uh, they had an organizational meeting. The first one was in Italy. And then in 2018, they had an organizational meeting. And that one, even though they had an Italy meeting, it wasn't an organizational meeting. They had the organizational one in was it Romania in 2018, I think, in, in September. In 2017, in, no, let me think. No, so the first organizational meeting was the one in Romania in 2017. The second one, anyway, I just got to get this correct, was in Italy in 2018. So the first Italian meeting they had wasn't an organizational meeting. It was the one in September in 2017 that was. Okay, because I always got this wrong, and Stephen would always correct me. But anyway, so they started organizing. And, and they set up, um, the Biblical Research Institute. No, no, it wasn't called the Biblical Research Institute. It wasn't the Catholic Imprimatur. It was, um, oh, um, the Doctrinal Analysis Group. That's what it was. Dang. And, um, and I was on the Doctrinal Analysis Group. They just put me on it. They would send papers that people had written and I was supposed to read these papers and say what I thought about it, if it was doctrinally sound or not. I wasn't really a fan of the idea. I thought, well, what does my opinion matter? I mean, if somebody, people should be able to read these papers themselves and all decide for themselves if, if there's anything in it. Like, none of us are any special authorities uh, to decide for other people whether they should read them or not. But the idea was, it's just, we're just doing this for um, the future news newsletter, right? Just Jeff needs some help. That, that sort of thing. But really it was, it was a, a biblical research institute type of idea. Um, I, I never approved any papers or disapproved any papers. You know, I, I read them all that they sent to me. You know, so, but, you know, the other people were, I guess, much more uh, opinionated about what other people thought. If people wrote things they were trying to sort of protect the movement from error or something. But the, but the movement wanted to be in that position, a position of a denomination. And to me, the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, when we think about a denomination, what is a denomination? What does that mean? What's the word denominate mean? Anybody know? It just means named, right? So, so they're going to name something. Okay. Sorry, I couldn't find the mute button. Uh, <laughs> I, I really, I really do like the quotes for when we search the spirit of prophecy with uh, denominated people. Yeah. Specifically, very specifically, the Seventh Day Adventist Church are God's denominated yeah. people. That's pretty neat. Yeah. So, so just the word denominate it means to name something, right? You got name right in it. That nom. That's that's the the name thing. Now. Yeah, so God's denominated people. Now, we know Israel was God's denominated people. But, you know, when we think about denomination and God's naming them, they're named in, in a certain sense is that they're a name denotes character, doesn't it? Right. So here, here's just one quote, letter 146 from 1909, by the way. Um, Christ has said of his people, ye are the light of the world. We are the Lord's denominated people to proclaim the truths of heavenly origin. The most solemn sacred work ever given to mortals is the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages to our world. So when we think about this, we're not just given a name. The name the name is, we're named for a purpose. Right? It's not just that we have a name, that we have, you know, this, I mean, actually, if you think about the Jews, they, they, they're God's denominated people, but they, I mean, they don't have a particular a denominational name as such. They're just they're just named. They're, that is, they're given a responsibility or a role uh, that is to reflect God's character. Here's another one from Testimonies to the for the Church, Volume Seven, page one hundred nine. It's from nineteen o two. We are to invite everyone, the high and low, the rich and the poor, all sects and classes, to share the benefits 
of our medical institutions. We receive into our institutions people of all denominations. But as for ourselves, we are strictly denominational people. We are sacredly denominated by God and are under his theocracy. But we are not unwisely to press upon anyone the peculiar points of our faith. So we're sacredly denominated by God. And we are under his theocracy. Now, when we think of denominations, they usually uh, have to do with men controlling men. You set up some men, they set up a denomination, and those men decide what's going to be done. I mean, we know that we don't have a, a government theocracy. You know, the, the government is, it's not like in the time of, of, of Moses, where, you know, Moses is under a theocracy and God is directly in control of it running the nation of Israel. Uh, we don't have that. But we are under his theocracy. That is, we're under God's control. I, I should probably put the screen so you can see these quotes I'm reading. I'm just sort of typed in denominated people and these are the things that pop up. Yeah, the people of God are to guard carefully against the seductive influence of the deceiver. They are to hold firmly to the truths which called them out from the world and led them to stand as God's denominated people. Um, it makes me very sad to think of how many will fall short of the Bible standard. If we knew that in just one year from now, the Lord would come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, but a feeling of solemnity would rest upon us. How earnestly we should strive to prepare for his coming, that clothed in the wedding garment we might go in unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. But this time, when we are so near the end, shall we become so like the world in practice that men may look in vain to find God's denominated, denominated people? Shall any man sell our peculiar characteristics as God's chosen people for any advantage the world has to give? Shall the favor of those who transgress the law of God be looked upon as of great value? Shall those whom the Lord has named his people suppose that there is any power higher than the great I am? Shall we endeavor to blot out the distinguishing points of faith that have made us Seventh-day Adventists? Our only safety is in standing constantly in the light of God's countenance. And you'll see a lot of these statements are in that, that period in the early 1900s. Uh, the children of Israel were denominated as a special people. By a most solemn covenant, they were pledged to be true to God. So we can see that as Israel had a covenant, we also have a covenant with God as well. The Lord does not design that his denominated, denominated people shall exhaust, exhaust their strength to carry on restaurants in the manner in which they are now conducted. Anyway, many complicated combinations of food that are not wholesome tend to make of the health reform a health deform. Hmm. Interesting. And one of the things I've learned about diet is the simpler a diet a person has, the better. And often we try to make, a, you know, health reform food that's going to be palatable to people. I think that that's, and there is a, there is a place for it to some degree, but people need to learn just to eat simple food. We have very perverted appetites. One thing I've learned recently is just basically any added fats, not really good. There's no benefit. They're actually detrimental. But anyway, that's another topic. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists are now to stand forth separate and distinct, a people denominated by the Lord as his own. Until they do this, he cannot be glorified in them. Truth and error cannot stand in co-partnership. Let us place ourselves where God has said that we should stand. We are to strive for unity, but not on the low level of conformity to worldly policy and union with the popular churches. So um, uh, 1903, again, you're going to see her talking about this denominated people in that history. So she says, who are these? God's denominated people. Um, those who on this earth have witnessed to their loyalty. Who are they? Those who have kept the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Those who have owned the crucified one as their savior. So, you know, when we, we deal with this idea of a denomination and we deal with it in a worldly fashion, uh, that's what was happening in this time, 1909, 
within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And you can read lots. Ellen White is talking about these situations in her counsel to the church at that time. And the church is not listening. So Jones definitely has a, a justification in pointing out these problems. So now as a matter of truth and fact, so this is Jones again, uh, Christ never sent me nor anybody else to preach a denomination, nor to build up a denomination, but to preach the gospel, and to build up Christians. And that is all that I shall ever do. The religion of Christ is neither international nor national nor denominational. <laughs> right, denominational. It is an individual, it is individual and universal. And in every denomination, and in no denomination, as well as in every nation, he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. So Jones is correct here in, in, in one sense, right? I mean, I think actually in the most important sense that um, you need to bring people to Christ, um, not just to a denomination. And often the denomination brings people to the denomination. They bring it to the church, but never to Christ. And, and people, they find a place for a person in the denomination. They have a social position. And, and the church seems to be happy enough with that. Uh, I remember back in the 1990s, there was uh, an Adventist review, uh, special edition, I guess it was. And it was about cultural Adventism. And a lot of people, uh, Adventists, are what we call cultural Adventists. Um, and, and this seemed to be a good thing. They were promoting this as a good thing. The fact, you know, that Adventists have their own culture. Now, I've never been a part of Adventist culture because I didn't grow up in Adventist culture and I'm definitely outside of the culture. I don't like the music and I don't like the way they dress and I don't like the food they eat and all those types of things. I never grew up with that and, and I've never liked it. It's kind of foreign to me. Um, I always think of Adventists, that, you know, you may be offended by this, but I think of them as very square, um, especially when I first became an Adventist. They're very square. Um, to me. And, and I just wasn't interested. I mean, they would listen to these quartets and, you know, it was very square music. It wasn't, it wasn't really spiritual music in my mind, right? Like, I like the old hymns, but, you know, a lot of this sort of modern Christian music I never really liked. And they seemed to think it was just the, the greatest thing. But it, it's fine. You know, it's nothing wrong with it. But for me, I wasn't interested in it, right? I wasn't interested in in what Adventists talk about and, and how they dress and, and, and everything. Um, it's kind of hard to explain. I mean, maybe if you were raised an Adventist, you, you might have a different feeling about it. Or if you became an Adventist, you might understand. But it, it's just not, I wasn't interested in the culture of Adventism. I was just interested in the truths of Adventism. And I, I definitely never fit in, right? I didn't fit into the, the way people were. And, and some of it, I, I actually think, is quite evil, uh, to be honest. So I remember when I first became an Adventist, uh, it was probably uh, it was probably maybe a year after I was an Adventist, because I know it, it was it was for some reason they had this thing. It was um, a Valentine's Day dinner, you know. And so the church had this thing. They invited us this Valentine's Day dinner, right? And so. So, you know, we went, you know, me and my first wife, we went to this Valentine's dinner. And, you know, I thought, well, you know, that's kind of weird. You know, maybe this, they're going to have like some kind of spiritual thing. It's like, you know, I have Christmas, you know, Bible studies and New Year's Bible studies and birthday Bible studies. You know, everything I do is, you know, I try to make it spiritual. And I thought this would be some kind of spiritual event, but it was really just a social event. And and I remember, you know, they they had like a talent show and and you know some of the guys are up there with blackface and doing stuff and 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 it was just extremely distasteful for me like i just i just couldn't believe what i was seeing and then i remember this one lady came in and she was she was dressed in like um she had a, like a turban on and this kind of robe and, and she was it was all sequined you know, Sequin wrote was, was uh, Caroline Walters, who's Elmer Knopf's daughter. And uh, 
and I never knew her at the time later on. That's a long story. But once when she came to church dressed like that and I realized you're the same person that I left that Valentine's Day social dinner when she walked in anyway. So yeah, I was not too happy. And then lots of other things like that. There's a lot of things Adventists do and they just they just think it's all fine. Right. And and I definitely did not. But and I'm not trying to say I'm better than them or anything. Just oh, I, would say, I would say modern Adventists, modern Adventists uh, do that quite a bit. But this was 50 years ago. I mean, 45 years ago, right, or whatever it was, 30. It's 30 some years ago, almost 40 years ago, right? I guess it'd be yeah. So you know, and Adventists have become much more worldly. But the worldliness existed in the church in Ellen White's day, and and the worldliness is in in what we do for entertainment in how we talk to each other in our social situations. I mean, it's it's hard to go to a potluck dinner and have a good spiritual conversation. You know, I'm always having to pull the conversation over to something spiritual. You know, or if you go to somebody's house for Sabbath dinner, it's hard to have a spiritual conversation. You know, there's just most homes, it's not going to happen. You You can try, but it's not going to go that way. They're always going to pull it away. And so, you know, that's to me cultural Adventism. Um, and, and, and to me, you know, the root word of the word culture is cult. And, and I really do think that most Seventh day Adventists are in a cult. That is, they're in a culture. They, they don't know the truth. They have no interest in the truth. They don't know Christ. They go through the forms of godliness, but they don't have the power of God. And most of it's for show. And that's just a reality. It's not like I'm not talking about any individual person. I'm just saying that that's just the way it is. That's humanity. And so so there is a truth of what Jones is talking about. It's not really about a denomination. But we can pull people into a denomination and give them positions and responsibilities and set up a social structure and culturalize them, and get them you know, sort of adapted to our culture. And we think that we've done them something good. But you search sea and yet land to find one proselyte and make him twofold a child of hell than you yourselves are. Something to that effect, Jesus said. And that's always struck me that that's what Adventism does. And I, I've seen it happen to many people who become Adventists. They become Adventists for the wrong reason. And, and we, they become Adventists too quickly because they don't even know the truth. Even when I became an Adventist, they, they, you know, nobody studied with me or anything. I mean, I'd studied on my own, so that was probably good. But I didn't know everything or accept everything that Adventists taught, even when I got baptized. So I'd only been to church it was the second time. So you can't expect me to know everything. But they shouldn't have baptized me so soon. But they like to baptize people. Okay, so um, so Jones goes on, he says, um, in this next point here, uh, that they bring up about Jones, his public utterances and public statements, which have been widely cir circulated, show his attitude to be antagonistic to the organized work of the denomination. Now, that does not specify just what public utterances and public statements of mine are meant. But it is only fair to suppose that the reference is to the particular ones that are of the record in this case. And the truth is that these utterances and statements were not published nor written nor even spoken until I had been called upon the second time by those of general conference standing in connection to the, to let the people know where I stand. It is also the truth that unto this hour, those utterances and statements would not have been made by me either publicly or privately. If those men had not called upon me as they did to let the people know where I stand, if they did not want it, why did they call for it? And when they did, so much wanted that they called the second time for it. Then when they got it, why were they not content with it? But no, the committee as such must rush, rush into print with a refutation that was more a confession and a demand that I should give proofs and tell how I knew. In response, I did give proof and did tell just how I knew and that this was to them sufficient proof and sufficient information as to how is sufficiently indicated by the fact that their own answer ever offered was that this one of force, this uncivilized action taken at Glans, Switzerland. Is it for that that they wanted to know where I stand? 
If they wanted this for other reasons, then why didn't they make other use of it? It is the very spirit of the Inquisition to demand of a man and press him to tell where he stands and then punish him for it. Now, maybe what Jones shouldn't have done is he shouldn't have, you know, said anything about where he stands. Now, now where he stood, of course, was just that what was being done didn't make sense to him. That's what we understand about it, that he didn't like the authority that was being exercised. But one thing we can see here um, that, that Jones brings out in, in the previous part was about the fact that the denomination is there to help men. And often they they give a profession of trying to help men, that they care about people, but they run rush rush, they run roughshod over people in the very way in which they act. We can see that their their actions are not redemptive, right? So Jones is facing these problems. They're very real problems. They're, he's not imagining this, and and he is being treated unfairly, right? Now he says here, is it antagonistic, right? So you're talking about him being antagonistic now, but now as to the fact and denominational truth. Is it true that my attitude is antagonistic to the denomination or to the organized work of the denomination? If this is true, according to your own standard publications, not any publications that I've written, but to those you claim and I admit are written through the spirit of prophecy, should not the standard and authoritative writings of the denomination be a proper and sufficient standard by which to decide this, to test this? Allow me to cite only a few brief passages from Desire of Ages. The soul that is yielded to Christ becomes his own fortress, which he holds in a revolted world, and he intends that no authority shall be known in it but his own. That plainly says all that I have ever claimed, that in the soul that is yielded to Christ, he intends that no authority shall be known in it but his own, that is Christ. That is the everlasting truth. I know it, and I will everlastingly preach it everywhere to every soul. And this in order that, so far as in me lies, the divine intent of the Lord Jesus shall be met. Uh, next is page 414, he says, um, paragraph, page 14, I guess it's page 14, paragraph 5. I don't know what the 414 is. The head of every man is Christ, God who put all things under the Savior's feet. Oh, I see, he's reading page 414 of Desire of Ages. Okay. God, who put all things under the Savior's feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The church is built upon Christ as its foundation. It is to obey Christ as its head. It is not to depend upon man or to be controlled by man. And Jones goes on. He says, that is the truth. There's where I stand. And that is just what I preach, that the church is not to depend upon man nor to be controlled by man. Further, I read the very next sentence. Many claim that a position of trust in the church gives them authority to dictate what other men shall believe and what they shall do. This claim does not, God does not sanction. Now, when we think about our church, does our church follow this statement from the spirit of prophecy? No. No, right? But we've seen this a thousand times. People try to usurp authority which is God's authority, and over others, dictating what other men shall believe and what they shall do. And that's not a power given to the church. God does not sanction this. He doesn't give it us to the position of trust, right? But people believe because they have that position of trust that they have that responsibility. And we see this in the movement, not just in the church, right? Never can we... We tell people, dictate to people what they shall believe and what they shall do. Just because God has given us a position of trust, that we have to take that trust as sharing the truths from God's word, but not dictating what others shall believe and what they shall do. We can reason with people. We can share. We can pray with them. We can minister to them. We can labor for them. But we can't control them. And, and we wouldn't really want to if we understood what that meant. Sometimes we think it would be nice, you know, if we 
can control people. But the reality is if we really look at ourselves, are we even fit to do that? We hardly can control ourselves. Definitely we don't want the responsibility of controlling it's almost, it's almost demonic. It's almost demonic yeah. Kind of control. Yeah, I mean I have I, I I'd like to say I have a natural aversion to controlling people, but I understand the feeling of it. I mean, it would be nice to just the people do what you think they should be doing. But it wouldn't help if you had the power to control them. People have to make their own decisions. And, and sometimes we could manipulate a person to do something that we thought was right, but they didn't want to do or not do something that we, we thought was wrong, and but they wanted to do. But it wouldn't really help them. People need to make their own decisions. They have to learn to trust God on their own. And then, of course, we make the profession of, well, you know, they're going to be influencing other people in a bad way. But we're not really concerned about the fact that what we're doing is influencing people in a bad way. Anyway, Jones goes on and he says, this is that is where I stand. And that is what I preach from the Bible, that a position of trust in the church never gives to any man or to any company of men any authority to dictate what man shall believe or what he shall do. And when men in position in the church do make this claim, or when they act as if they made the claim that they have authority to dictate or to decide what other men shall believe or what they shall do, then I'm ready to say to all people, just as this book says, this claim does God does not sanction. It is eternally right, and I will hold it and preach it. Further, I read the next sentence. The Savior declares all our brethren. All are exposed to temptation and are liable to error. Upon no finite beings can we depend for guidance. The rock of faith is the living presence of Christ in the church. So that's again from Desire of Ages in page 414, I believe. It is the perfect truth. So this is Jones now. It is the perfect truth of God that upon no fight finite being can we depend for guidance. And I'm not going to depend upon any finite being but only upon the infinite spirit of the infinite being for guidance. That is what I hold, and that is what I preach. And I will do everything I possibly can by preaching the word, by prayer, and by instruction in every way to have every soul to receive that infinite spirit and to depend, and how to depend fully and only upon him for guidance. Now, it's fine for Jones to say this, because what he's saying is true. Like, I can't argue with Jones here. But what Jones is not doing is not practicing what he preaches. He's trying to. But if he really believed this, he wouldn't be there at the general conference reading this to them. I don't know if you all agree with me on that. I mean, instead of telling everybody else to go to the source? Well, instead of just, just accepting the fact that the church doesn't want him. I mean, if the church doesn't want you, that's their loss. I mean, I've had to, I've, I've gone through some very similar things in, in, in the church, and I'm sure many of you have. And, and I've tried to be reconciled to people. I, I tried to be reconciled to the church. I tried to be reconciled to the movement. But if they don't want me, do I need to go and, and tell them how wrong they are? Does it benefit anybody? Not really. Not. No. Right? I mean, you know, I could go to the Canadian group and when Jeff is presenting, I could go there and I could start asking questions. Do you think that's really going to do any good? Nobody wants to hear what I have to say. So there's no point doing anything about it. Just do the things that God asks you to do and, and leave everything to him, right? And that's the best thing to do. I've, I mean, I'm not saying I've always done that, but I actually learned in some of my early experience in the church when I was being treated badly that, you know, trying to fight it was, wasn't going to help because none of them were willing to listen. There's no point trying to reason with somebody who can't be reasoned with. Cause I used to just think that people, if they just knew the truth, you know, they would change their minds about whatever it is. But the fact is that they have no interest in knowing the truth. Because they could know the truth if they wanted to. Right? So Jones is just, these people have no interest in what he has to say. And he's, he's not going to benefit anybody in this. 
Instead, he's going to appear, because they set a trap for him, really. He's going to appear to be exactly what they are accusing him of, opposed to the de- denomination. You know, the very thing that he says, you know, aggress, what's, what's the word there that he had there? Antagonistic, right? <laughs> They're putting him into a corner where he's going to just look antagonistic. So <laughs> you can't win for losing. Okay. It is the truth of God that the rock of faith is the living presence of Christ in the church. So it's quoting the spirit of prophecy there and it's saying it's true. And all that I'm asking of any person or of any denomination is that the place that belongs to the living presence of the living Christ in the church shall be given to him in his own living person. Again, I read on page 668 of the Desire of Ages. As Christ lived the law in humanity, so we may do if we will take hold of the strong for strength. But we are not to place the responsibility of our duty upon others and wait for them to tell us what to do. We cannot depend for counsel upon humanity. He also goes on, he says, it is the truth of God that we cannot depend for counsel upon humanity. He agrees. The Lord Jesus is the divine, the God-given counselor. By his divine spirit, he comes and dwells personally with each believer as his head, is all in all. That is Christianity. And I will preach it and teach it everywhere. And why should that be antagonistic to any organized work? Again, I read the next sentence. Now, um, uh, so before we read the next sentence there. So so one of the things about um, when we think about Christ as the head, that doesn't mean that we don't take into account what God is saying to other people. It means we, because it's a body, right? It means through Christ, we actually cooperate with one another, right? Not because of human authority but because of the authority of Christ. That is, a person who is truly converted and truly connected with Christ will cooperate with other people who are truly converted and connected with Christ. Amen? So one of the things that that we must always strive to do is to cooperate with our brethren. If we, we look at what's happened in this movement, I've labored for years to cooperate with others, to communicate with others, to listen to others. But if they don't want to listen, if they don't want, if, if they have a different spirit, a different idea, they think that I'm a problem, there's nothing I can do about it. I can only be connected to Christ. And they can say, well, you know, he's just a problem, right? You know, he's, he's trying to do this or trying to do that. And, and it's all misrepresentation. I mean, I've had people talking to me on the phone, one one person in the Canadian group, like for an hour straight, just telling me all the problems that 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 were with me and all these things that she imagined um, that I was doing and thinking. She had no interest in hearing any response to that. Right. She had already settled in her mind exactly what I was. And so there was no point of responding. It was nice that she informed me exactly what she thought of me. But it, it didn't matter, right? There's not anything I could do about it. You're not going to change somebody's mind um, by arguing with them. You know, you know, like you can't make somebody love you. You know, it's the same sort of thing. Uh, either people do or they don't. And you can't make somebody who's not connected to Christ understand that you are connected to Christ. Then what you're doing is is Christ's work. If they've decided that they have their own way, that's that's up to them. Right? So it's just it's just a reality that we have to accept. Now, we can understand Jones' disappointment. He wanted the church to go in a direction. He wanted Christ to come back. And the church did not come along with him. And so much so that they said, "We don't even want you." So I can understand Jones' disappointment. But Jones got to this point partly because we, we could blame the other people, right? We can always blame the other people. But we always have to look at ourselves and what we have done to contribute. And I can say there's lots of times I've contributed to the criticisms that have come my way. doesn't mean I could have stopped them completely. 
but I need to recognize the things in myself uh, that have hindered God's work. And, and often the worst thing I can do, and, and I've done some things in this movement, you know, getting upset in a meeting or, you know, calling somebody an idiot or whatever it is. Uh, didn't call him an idiot, but said what he said was ridiculous, uh, nonsense. I shouldn't have done that. I, I basically did in some ways exactly what Jones did. Now, you know, can always justify it. But the point is, we do things that hinder God's work. That is, we get caught in a trap because we are not prepared. And Christ never got caught in a trap, but they still crucify. So it's not like if, if you do everything right, things are going to always work out, you know, the way you want them to. So, but, but we need to be aware of that. So he says, he reads in the next sentence, the Lord will teach us our duty just as willingly as he will teach somebody else. If we come to him in faith, he will speak his mysteries to us personally. And this is really important that we learn this because many people do look to man. And, and one of the ways in which people look to man, I remember, um, I'm telling a lot of personal stories here, but uh, when I was a new Adventist and, and the church saw that I was fairly intellectual and liked reading and um, I wrote some articles and gave them to the pastor and the elders and and, and then, you know, and then I, you know, had the Bible study group uh, that would be 39 years ago. Uh, tomorrow would be the first upper room Bible study we had in the attic of my house. Was my son Micah was born on April 19th, the Friday evening, and the next day we had our first upper room Bible study. So 39 years ago. And uh, so we had this Bible study group and, and I started to be a bit more talkative. You know, we had a Bible study group at my house. I, for the first time, started talking in public, so to speak. And and so the church kind of was interested in me. And, and I remember talking to a pastor at camp meeting that year and sharing some stuff I was learning. And he's like, yeah, you really need to go to to the to college and you really need to, you know, like get pro- proper training. And, and um, there always seemed to be this idea that somehow and even papers that I've written. You know, you talk to a pastor, you know, they think that what you want is their approval, that somehow because they want man's approval. And they just think, well, you know, you want to get trained so that people will listen to you, right? Because nobody's going to listen to you unless you have a degree. And and so you need to have the approval of man in order to be a person who can speak with authority. Because it doesn't matter what you're saying, if it's true or not. But if you got that piece of paper, you know, if you're the pastor, then people will actually listen to you. And and what's the problem with that? What's the problem with that thinking? Anybody got comments on that thinking? Well, it's like with Christ. I mean, he didn't have have to be trained by the rabbis to preach and to live a holy life. So the praise of man and the credentials of man are worthless. Right. And he, he taught with authority and not as the scribes, right? Like he had authority because Truth is the most powerful authority. And, and so the danger of having human authority is that you can actually not treat, teach the truth and people will listen to you because you have authority, right? So a pastor can get up and speak and say all kinds of nonsense and people will actually listen to him. But the authority that he has is just the authority of man. Yeah, it, and Samuel, it's, it's so easy to dismiss truth because of that thinking, yeah. So we need to look at something, whether it's true or not, not who is advocating a view or who is saying this. The question is, is it true? Does it agree with the scriptures? And that takes individual responsibility to know whether something is true or not. We want to pass that responsibility on to someone else. You decide for me what is truth so I don't have to think about it. That's a very dangerous position to be in. So anyway, Joan says, that's what I preach and that's what I teach everywhere to everybody. That is the truth of Christianity and I will teach it, right? That he, God can speak to each person personally. And he says, that is enough on this phase, though there is much more. I take another. I read now from page 450. It is about Jesus and the church leaders of his day. Uh, to avoid useless, useless conflict with the leaders of Jerusalem, he had restricted his labors to Galilee. This is Owen White. 
his apparent neglect of the great religious assemblies, and the enmity manifested toward him by the priests and rabbis were a cause of perplexity to the people about him and even to his own disciples and his kindred. In his teachings, he had dwelt upon the blessings of obedience to the law of God, and yet he himself seemed to be indifferent to the service which he had been, which had been divinely established. His mingling with publicans and others of ill repute, his disregard of the rabbinical observances, and the freedom with which he set aside the traditional requirements concerning the Sabbath, all seeming to place him in an antagonism to the religious authorities, excited much questioning. His brothers thought it a mistake for him to alienate the great and learned men of the nation. They felt that these men must be in the right and that Jesus was at fault in placing himself in antagonism to them, right? So Jones is being accused of being antagonistic. Uh, to the leadership. Was it a mistake for him to alienate the great and learned men of the nation? It was not. Was Jesus at fault in placing himself in antagonism to them? It was not. But there were those who thought that he was. And why did they think so? Oh, just because they felt that these men must be in the right. And why did they feel that these men must be in the right? Oh, well, just because they were in, they were the religious authorities, the leaders at Jerusalem. Just because these men occupied position in place, they must be in the right. And of course, just because of this, Jesus must be at fault in placing himself in antagonism to them. But in all this, Jesus was not at fault in any sense, whatever. He was eternally right all the time. And the real antagonism was not at all on his part. And Jesus, of course, did not act antagonistic. He didn't. I mean, we could say that when, that when he, he spoke about the leaders, you know, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, right? But we know that came at a certain point in his ministry, right? So there, there, and, and of course, Jesus is Jesus, not us. But he's not, he's not going out of his way, and he's not, he's not trying to defend himself in any of this, which Jones is. Jones is right, but I just think that that this actually just sort of added fuel to the fire. But you know, it was Jones; he did what he did. Okay, um, and, and it did affect his relationship with the spirit of prophecy, which we're going to look at at some point as well. But um, uh, therefore, disagreement with church leaders to dissent from religious authorities, even to occupy an attitude of antagonism to them, is never in itself any evidence of error or fault. No man, no association or combination of men, ever has any authority because of any official position or place in the church of Christ. And that's true in this movement. It's true that the Jeff has no authority, and I'm not, not trying to be hard on Jeff, but he has no authority over us in what we believe, in what we do, right? Now, the one thing I want to say about, about this situation that we have in the movement at the present time, you know, that there's been this, this idea, and people aren't happy about it, that Jeff is, is shutting down, the, down those who who oppose what he's saying, right? That is, people have different views about July 18th and so forth. And just Jeff is saying, you know, if, if they're not for us, they're against us, and we don't want to have anything uh, to do with them. You know, we're not going to listen to them. They're not going to have an opportunity to speak in our studies. Now, I do believe that a person has every right as an individual to whether they want to listen to someone or not. So, for instance, if I have a Facebook page and I want to block somebody from that Facebook page, I have every right to do so. doesn't mean it's a good idea. doesn't mean it's, 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 you know, it's the best thing to do. But it's not a sin, right, to block people. Right? It's, people can do that. I mean, if, if it's your football, you can take it and go home. The game's not going your way. But I don't know if it's a good idea because, you know, might, you might not be able to play football again. Uh, nobody may want to play with you. So if you want to influence Dude, people, oh, that's a that's a good analogy. I gotta hand it to you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So if you want to influence people, like if Jeff really wants us to listen to what he has to say, he's gotta play ball, right? He's gotta cooperate. You any and if I want to to win someone, 
I need to, I need to be conciliatory. I need to, I need to offer that person an opportunity to speak. If I just cut that person off, I'm not going to be able to help him. And, and that was the problem really with the church and how they dealt with the 2520 movement. It was whatever they wanted to call it or the 2025 movement or whatever they thought it might be. Right. They had no interest in actually helping anybody. They just wanted the game to go their way because they had the ball. And, and what you end up with is you end up with any time you try to approach even something that's error, you just don't do it that way. All you do is promote error. Sure, you can get those people out of your church, but you're going to have a lot of, of casualties that aren't necessarily people that you, you didn't want to leave. Right? So, so it just never works. Man's ideas on how to control others uh, always are, are destructive. So, so, you know, it's, it's just something to me that, that's, um, that we have to think about, right? We have to think about how, how are we winning others? And, and in everything that I try to do, I'm not saying I'm always successful, but I try to communicate with people. I give people opportunities. I don't, I don't want to shut people down. And, and I've invited lots of people to, to do presentations here who will not do presentations. They say, if I do a presentation in your study, people will be upset with me. And I said, well, I want to know what I want. I want you to be able to present so that we can discuss what it is you're studying in, in our environment, because it, it's a more free and open environment. We can take our time, but no, they don't want to. So but that's their choice. But I, I think people make a mistake in close, shutting down other people and also not wanting to study things in an open way. Right. Because, you know, if a brother differs with you, you know, should not point to make him out to be a heretic or, you know, misrepresent what he's saying. But you should sit down with him and and listen to what he has to say, because you don't necessarily know what he believes and you don't even know necessarily what you believe. You might find that he's correct. I'm paraphrasing spirit of prophecy here. And, and, and this is the responsibility of every Christian and every Christian minister. To do this, I remember um, in Warburg Church, uh, we had our previous pastor, he did a sermon against me in a business meeting against the 2520. Now, I still was teaching Sabbath school back then, and I was teaching Sabbath school one time. I think this was before then, but it might have been after. I'm not sure. Um, but it was around that time. And um, we were talking about this issue of, you know, if somebody's teaching error. And I, and I read the Spirit of Prophecy quote, and he says, should I have to listen to everybody who's teaching error? I, every doctor, every wind of doctrine? And I said, well, as a pastor, it's your responsibility for the flock that any wind of doctrine, no matter how much you think it's an error, if it's blowing in your church, you need to spend time with the people presenting it. It's your responsibility as a pastor to do that. Now, of course, he didn't like that. So I, I think his sermon was done after that. But uh, um, but it is, right? If somebody's teaching error, or I think they're teaching error, and, and I'm a pastor, it's my responsibility to sit down with that person and listen to what they have to say. It's my responsibility to understand what it is they're teaching. Right. I can't say why I can't look at everything. Well, you, you definitely have to look at the things that are facing your church if you're a pastor. And if you're not a pastor, we're all pastors, really. But, you know, any any error that somebody's teaching that may influence people that, you know, you need to understand it. You need to know if it is truth first, because it might be there might be something there that you you never heard of before. And there might be truth there. But if it is error, you need to know that it's error and you need to know how to show that it's error in a Christian way. And you need to labor with the people who are teaching that error, not to cut them off, but to study with them, to be open, to listen, and then to show them point by point when they are in error and be corrected if you're the one in error. 
right? That's just our responsibility. So we're just going to leave it, read this last uh, paragraph here, and then we'll close with prayer. Therefore, disagreement with church leaders to dissent from religious authorities, even to occupy an attitude of antagonism to them, is never in itself the evidence or error of fault. No man, no association or combination of men ever had any authority because of any official position or place in the Church of Christ or in any church professing to be the Church of Christ. And when any man or set of men ever does have it in any church, it is because that church is of men only and not of Christ. The princes of the Gentiles, the heathen, exercise dominion over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. Among Christians, it is not so. And wherever it is so in any church, then just so far that it is a heathen church. For it is only among the Gentiles that such things are done and allowed to be done. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, well, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for the Sabbath. Thank you for the words of scripture that um, speak to our hearts. We know, Lord, that we see in Jones an attitude that we sometimes have. We can be right. We know Jones is correct. Lord, we need to learn to trust that that you can take care of your truth. We also need to listen to what Jones is saying, because these things are true. And um, we need to recognize them in ourselves. It's easy to see the Catholic Church is bad. It's easy to see the Seventh-day Adventist Church is bad. It's easy to see other people who treat us are bad. But it's much more difficult, Lord, to see these things in ourselves. But the same spirit of the Antichrist can exist in our lives, even when we profess to believe the truth. So we leave each person in your hands, and we pray uh, for the studies tomorrow, um, that you can bless them. And uh, thank you for the Sabbath and the fellowship that we have again. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.